pressure continues to be normal. Our EPA chamber pressure looks good. Traveling up. Water towers can fly! Yes! Ego down to nominal. Water down to SCE dog. Bring it, SCE dog. Oh. Yikes. You bet. Concur. We don't need any more of these. Space Flight Live. You can tell because you can see our faces, uh, which is what we do when we do NASA Space Flight Live. But welcome everybody. I'm Jack Byer with NASA Space Flight. I'll be hosting for today. And of course, it's NASA Space Flight Live. So I'm joined by, let's see if I can do this right. I'm joined by Ian. Yes. You hey. Right. hey, Jack. Hey, everyone. How's it going? What's up, Ian? And I'm also joined by Alex. Hey, <laughs> what's up? <laughs> Alex, you're in like a sea of blue. What's going on there? Yeah, my background didn't work, so I did a trick there, but sh that's that's secret. <laughs> okay, sorry. That's inside baseball. Right, well, NASA Spaceflight Live, as we normally do, we're gonna go over the events of the week in spaceflight, and we'll be chatting a little bit, and of course, we'll be answering mm -hmm. your questions. So if you have any questions, at NASA Spaceflight in the chat, and we will see it pop up in some software that Michael wrote. I've got my iPad here with a nice little second screen situation going on. And yeah, I mean, what say you guys? Should we jump right into it? I say so. Let's do it. All right. Well, I think uh, I think it, we would be remiss if the first thing we mentioned this week was not um, a little thing called Hurricane Ian. Um, and I think I think for that we'll let Ian take it because you know. Ian, Ian, <laughs> stick together. I feel so, I feel like just gross discussing this because in all honesty, this was like a very like unfortunate natural disaster. Like it's, it's impacted millions of people across Florida. And honestly, like if anyone watching is down in Florida or has family or friends down there, we genuinely hope they're all doing well. Um, but yeah, there's been impacts all across Florida and that includes Cape Canaveral. So there's been a lot of preparations before the hurricane. Like you could see here, SpaceX evacuated their marine assets from Port Canaveral uh, just to be on the safe side in case anything happened there. Uh, thankfully, the damage at Cape Canaveral was not that bad. Um, we also saw other preparations like SLS being rolled back into the high bay three of the vehicle assembly building um, just to get off pad 39B in case anything ha bad happened, in case any bad winds or debris flying, things along those lines. But NASA did confirm there's been no damage to flight hardware, which is great news. Um, and they're going to take that time while they're in the vehicle assembly building to do some testing on the flight termination system again, uh, possibly replace the batteries, do any extra inspections on the vehicle they need. So it's kind of a a bit of a bittersweet moment for SLS. They had to go back to the assembly building, but they get a little time to look things over again. Um, and yeah, now because they've had to go back to the assembly building and because it'll take time to get it out of the building, get it to the pad, prepare it at the pad, uh, they've been pushed back to November 12th is the earliest launch attempt. So there's a launch window running between November 12th to the 27th. Um, so that is the next time that they are targeting right now. Um, you can see also SpaceX had to do some preparing because as we know, they're building a Starship pad at 39A. They have a huge crane there, the LR-11350. Um, they had to lower that down because you don't want high winds knocking your very expensive crane over, damaging equipment, things along those lines. Um, and yeah, you could see this is what it looked like at Port Canaveral over the past few days. Uh, it did get pretty choppy, pretty windy. Again, thankfully, Hurricane Ian had uh, dropped down to, I believe, Category 1 or even a tropical storm at that point. So it wasn't that bad of an impact on the east coast of Florida, but still some noticeable uh, storm effects there. Um, also, on the Cape Canaveral side, we saw Terran 1 from Relativity being rolled back into the hangar. Uh, that followed after a successful string of cryogenic proofing, uh, wet dress rehearsals, and static fire tests. So a great test campaign there for Terran 1. They've now rolled it back to the hangar, possibly to fully integrate the vehicle for flight. So uh, maybe there'll be some good things coming out of that, too. Um, and they said that they're going to be resuming test operations uh, this coming week. So that is great to hear. No op no. Uh, major uh, delays there. Um, and with ULA, on the other hand, when we're talking about other launch providers, uh, the launch of their SES-20 and SES-21 mission on top of their Atlas V rocket was delayed until Tuesday. Again, that was to uh, reduce any chance of it being on the pad during the storm and getting damaged. Uh, there were even some weather reports, I think, that said like 80% no-go chance of weather. So uh, it wouldn't have worked out either way. 
Um, so yeah, that's going to be uh, in two days now. And then with SpaceX, uh, like we saw in the video, uh, they had to delay bringing back some of their marine assets. So uh, Booster 1073, which was uh, on top of one of their drone ships, had to be kind of moved to the Bahamas to ride out the storm a bit. Um, but now it's coming back, actually, right as we speak, it's coming back into Port Canaveral. Um, as we can see on our Space Coast live cameras, there it is, Booster 1073 coming back into Port Canaveral. And there's a special guest on Pad 39A there. Um, that is Booster 1077, I believe, uh, getting ready for the Crew-5 mission. They did do a demonstration, a rehearsal of that mission a few days ago, um, and now they are getting ready for possibly a static fire test in the coming few days or so. So a lot of good things happening there at Cape Canaveral. Things are getting back on track, back on schedule. Um, there's also the Galaxy 33-34 mission that's going to be launching on Thursday from Pad 40. Um, that's going to fly on Booster 1060-14. So uh, getting very high up in the numbers there. And that is the first time that a customer is flying on a booster um, from with, that is flying later than a 10th flight. So this is a huge milestone, a huge amount of trust coming from a customer here. And it really shows how well SpaceX is um getting in terms of reliability of their reflown boosters. Um, and actually, I just got corrected in the back channel. The astronaut dress rehearsal was earlier this morning. So uh, that was much more recent. But yeah, again, they're getting ready for Crew 5. Great to see some more crewed flights coming back to Cape Canaveral. And uh, yeah, things are getting back on track after Hurricane Ian, thankfully. And it looks like there's no major impacts at the Cape. So good news there in that term. Yeah, definitely good news there. I know uh, several areas of Florida got walloped by it. And I know some people are still without power, still dealing with flooding. And so it's definitely uh, not, you know, not some, a situation to make light of. Definitely mm -hmm. hoping everybody is uh, recovering okay. And, and there's not too much damage to people that are out there in Florida. And it's like you said, good to see launch providers starting to get back into the swing of things after mm -hmm. uh, such a crazy event. It's, it's just nuts, right? That uh the sls you know they after after everything after getting a waiver from the range after figuring out the leak uh with the with their wet dress rehearsal thing um, or their tanking test whatever you want to call it after all of that ultimately ends up that <laughs> that a hurricane uh comes through and especially especially i don't know maybe not ironic but um notable because there had been like no no hurricanes to hit florida so far in what was supposed to be a very active hurricane season and then all yeah. of a sudden bam ian out of nowhere um so yep. the dates the, the the new launch period for uh for sls is between november 12th and november 27th that that is launch period 28 launch period 27 nah they're not there that's out of the question at this point so now we're going for sometime in uh launch period 28 which looks like it is all night launches up until sort of the latter half of the window um but that is uh that is what we're looking at there uh so more power to sls and all the teams getting the rocket buttoned up inside the vehicle assembly building we do have a question um i don't know the answer i don't even know if this has been announced yet but maybe either of you know um ghost dragon is asking do we have a date for sls to roll to the pad do we know when it's going to roll back yet i don't think we've heard any concrete information i think that would depend on how long the flight termination system testing and battery replacement goes um nasa may choose to roll out a few weeks ahead of launch maybe about a week ahead of launch um and we're probably going to hear that more as they get further along and then complete the testing and any inspections they want to do inside the vehicle assembly building. So I don't believe I've heard anything along those lines, um, but it might be uh, a, a bit early to have any information on that. Yeah, and also we should be looking at when they actually finish the all, all the preparations, because once they actually test the FTS, that's when the clock thing starts on the FTS, and that's when they have that 20 day window. But we know already that that can be extended or um, at least well over a month. And, and so I will guess that once they actually have a gauge of when they're gonna be doing that test, that's gonna set up the launch attempts that they're gonna be doing. And that also sets up the rollout dates. So imagine they, they target the, the latter half of that period of launch period 28. Uh, that will probably mean uh, rollout in the first, second week of November. But if the target may be the 
the initial part of it, maybe it could be towards the end of October, maybe spooky season rollout, but we'll see. <laughs> spooky, spooky rollout. Oh, the orange rocket, the pumpkin rocket. Yeah, it's the pumpkin rocket. Uh, it kind of I mean, fits. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's branding. It definitely fits. Um, so yeah, that was, yay. Is that your paper one? Yeah, I brought a few to college. <laughs> wait, wait, sh show it again. I can't believe that's paper. Yeah, it's actually cardstock. So it's like thick paper. Oh, I can't Wait, get it. Like, the oh, the spooshies. I was going to say zoom out, like hold it further away so we can see the whole thing. Just completely taking over the show so I can ah. ask you to show me the rocket. <laughs> there we got awesome. so off topic here. But yeah. <laughs> Way to go. Hey, no, the, the topic right here, it says Artemis 1, SLS. Okay, yeah, we're good. We're on topic. It's a topic, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that is, I think that's that's basically the situation for Hurricane Ian. Um, Florida is, and people in Florida are slowly uh, going to be recovering. We went over relativity, uh, you know, rolling Terran 1 back to the hangar. We went over ULA and SES um, coming up here. And yeah, I think that's that's pretty good. That's pretty good. You know, uh, does anyone have anything else they want to they touch on? I'm going to look for a couple of questions. I would like yeah. to touch on the, on the, well, that's the, the drive dress rehearsal that happened this morning, uh, the crew actually arrived yesterday to the Kennedy Space Center and then they did uh, a drive dress rehearsal. And as, as we said before, we, we're kind of expe expecting at least a static fire today just because of what they said on the conference a week ago that the day they did the, so they will arrive the next day, it will be the dry dress rehearsal. And on the same day, it will also be the static fire test. And then they will do, you know, the launch runners review and then launch on, you know, whenever that launch happened, because this conference was before Ian uh, came through. And so they were like, we don't know about the schedules, but it's gonna be um, sort of like in that timeline, once the crew arrives, the next day is gonna be dry dress rehearsal and static fire, and then so on and so forth. It's gonna be just keep the ball rolling. Um, I wanted to say something about that heavily used uh, booster on, on a commercial launch because there's a caveat there. While we kind of know that was probably the the, booster to be penciled down for that. We also know that SpaceX likes to change boosters uh, from time to time. Those are more especially the case for, uh, well, we can see there the pictures of the of the crew of the dry dress rehearsal these this morning. Uh, those, those suits look great. <laughs> um, while they do a lot of booster switching, for example, for Starlink missions, I'm not really sure if that may happen with a customer mission, but it's a total possibility because we saw they had a schedule, the Starlink Group 4.3, uh, uh, not 4.3, geez, that was ages ago, uh, 4.36 uh, launch. And because of Ian, they basically eliminated that from, from, the, from, the, from, from the timeline right now. They were like, eh, no biggie. We're gonna go to the customer mission, which has uh, obviously it's more important than than a Starlink right now. Um, so that Starlink mission is gonna leapfrog and go more or less towards the end of October, more or less. And so there's a possibility that the booster for that mission is now gonna fly on that other mission, the, the Galaxy 33, 34 mission that is gonna be launching hopefully late next week, uh, at least as early as Thursday. Uh, so just adding that note because don't be surprised if we get to Thursday and then suddenly they launch with another booster. However, that booster for 436 was also a booster that was on its 10th flight. It was B1062-10. And that booster will also be another regular of, you know, a customer mission, a purely customer mission, uh, having a booster that is flying on such a high flight. Um, we've seen, Right share missions like with the Starlink or transport missions with also like high number of flights for the booster. However, there's not being any sort of like solely commercial, wholly commercial uh, launch dedicated for, for a customer uh, that had one, one of these high end uh, life leaders, you know, of the fleet. So that's, that's kind of, kind of impressive that, you know, the customers now are like, yeah, sure. Let's, let's fly on this one. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, NRO is flying on reused boosters. It's 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 normal now. Yay. Yeah. Um, just another milestone here. Is is Galaxy 3334, is that Hotbird or is that something else? 
Oh, uh, oh we got something happening here. Looks like oh. the crew arm is being retracted. Now, if I'm correct, we sh that means we're about 45 minutes out from a static fire because the static fire does completely uh, demonstrate and do it as a complete dress rehearsal of launch, of course, without the launch part and without the astronaut part. So if the arm's retracting, that's a pretty good sign they're going for a static fire in about 45 minutes. Did you just look at your wrist with no watch on it? Nope, I did not. Um, but yeah, so yeah, that's a really good sign that uh, 45 minutes from now, possibly a static. Oh, that would be directly yeah, at 4, 4 o'clock. That would be perfect. Yeah. They really right do like to do static fires right on the hour. So that that clicks, that works. Love it. All right. Well, we'll keep our eyes on it. Good thing we have good old space. <laughs> Thanks, Doss. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Doss. And one thing for these for these static fires, they even activate, well, not activate as in it activates and everything. They, they even arm the, the launch escape system. And there's a, a marine notice uh published for, for this one. Uh because you know it can it can drop the, the the thing can just basically fly off if there's if there's any any emergency during the the static fire test and dragon can just fly off uh, on these ones and so they they even publish uh, an, a marine notice for for boarders to just not approach the area nearby just because of that because you know it could be a hazard it uses hy hypergolics you know uh, hydrazine and things like that it's nasty stuff you don't want to be near that. I always heard I always heard breathing hyd hydrazine was a good thing. Like it makes you feel good. No? I don't think that that is the case. <laughs> yeah, don't try hydrazine at home. Legal Spice disclaimer. <laughs> Spicy orange gas bad. All right, fine. Um, <laughs> cool. So we'll keep our <laughs> okay. <laughs> not responsible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and uh, uh, not responsible. There you go. <laughs> all right. Oh, cool. I love that. Do not breathe the spicy orange gas. Um, cool. Well, we'll keep our eyes on Falcon 9 on 39A, and uh, hopefully we get to see a static fire here while we are gabbing about various space flight events from the week. But I think we're I think we're all set on uh, Hurricane Ian and its after effects and getting back into the swing of things here. Um, if anybody has anything else, or I can go, let me do some a couple a couple a couple two three questions, questions here. Yeah. Yeah. Just throw them. Um, Amiga clone is asking, has there been any aerial view of SpaceX Roberts Road since Hurricane Ian? Not yet, but we're working on it. Oh. <laughs> um, let's see. Ghost Dragon asked about SLS rolling. We answered that one. Tarn um, is asking, are there any new upgrades with the new Falcon 9 booster or is the design frozen? This is probably an Alex question. I've always heard that like even amongst block five boosters they're like no two falcon nine uh rockets are really exactly the same um but yeah i don't know specifically with uh what did we, just, did we see a new one rolled out recently or something um what are they asking yeah. about here so so apart you know there's there's a new booster at 39a obviously because you know it's it's not because it's a crew flight it's just because they they put a, a new one crew flights can really fly now on flight proven boosters we've seen that many times now uh but for this mission in particular is flying on a, on a new booster yay new new booster in the fleet um actually on, on a secondary note to that i think jared once hinted that this booster is also going to fly in polaris stone but we haven't heard anything about that since that note um but you know, there's also a new booster at McGregor. If you have seen the latest, uh, I think it was the the last video that we put out or the previous one that was about McGregor, and it showed the the static fire test. We did a, a Falcon side chat kind of thing, and you can also see it on McGregor Live. That's where we did the Falcon side chat uh, on McGregor Live. Yeah, there you go, Das. <laughs> I'm seeing the notes, and. And, and yeah, we were talking about that as, as it happened and it did a, a 78 second uh, static fire test. And this one is actually gonna fly eventually as a Falcon Heavy side booster, but for the first few flights, it's gonna be flying as a Falcon 9 booster. Now, do they include any upgrades? We think that yes, but not major upgrades. So it's not like they're stretching the booster or adding, you know, I don't know, more more grid fins or something like that. No, it's it's not that kind of upgrades. It's more like uh, one of the things that you can see 
if you actually pay a lot of attention, and by that I mean very close up views of the boosters, um, a few, like a, a dozen boosters ago, maybe more like 20 boosters ago, uh, they change interstage design of how they join it to the, to the tankage, for example. That's one of the things. If you also see the recent boosters that have flown, you can also see that the camera change or things like that. Like there's subtle things that you can you can sort of see from the outside. There's obviously probably more upgrades in you know in the innards of the of the booster, but we cannot see those obviously because you know. But but it's to be expected. Minor changes that you can expect from learning refurbishment and reuse and how to basically make it easier and cheaper to be reusing all those boosters and kind of make sense. As, as long as it is not major changes, the booster is just gonna behave sort of the same. It's just gonna be easier to do this, to do that, like mm, minor changes. We, we have seen though some changes, not on the boosters themselves, but on operations uh, for some Starlink missions where they have done shorter uh, loading times for liquid oxygen just to pack more into the boosters, but that's more operational and not really a hardware upgrade. And that's the long answer. <laughs> the short is yes, but minor upgrades. <laughs> you can see there they, they've tested, uh, that was P1076 at McGregor being tested with a, it's a cryo test. They, you can see the pulleys pulling down on, on the thing, like the tie downs. That's really yeah, they're, cool. they're like holding down the booster while it fires. Yeah, it's so always cool. love to see that. Just like a Starbase, we we see the con crusher thing and the same thing yeah. here. Well, yeah, that was a that was a long answer, Alex, but it was a good answer. I mean, I think the shortest possible version of that answer would be just Mr. Burns saying yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> but it, but in the absence of that, oh, do we have a poll in chat or did that end already? Uh, we had a poll as to what was the best booster, a shiny one or a used one. I think it might have ended, though. Too I'm, slow. I'm still seeing it. It's still okay, it's still there. there. I'm team yeah. shiny Good. booster for sure. I, I also picked shiny booster. So chat, weigh in, weigh in what your preferred uh, best Falcon 9 <laughs> booster is. But while we're talking about McGregor, um, some other interesting things happened, right? Uh, we put out a video highlighting this yeah. rapid relight test of a Raptor engine. Um, but was it like nine seconds? They fired a Raptor engine, they waited like nine seconds, and then they they relit it uh, for another, I don't even know, number of seconds. Uh, and I think that's, that may not be the first time it's ever happened, but it's the first time we've noticed it, that's for sure. Um, pretty nifty stuff there. Someone said, is Alex turning into Philip's loss? Oh, you don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> the, the SpaceX Phillips loss, I would dare say. Yeah, I was gonna say Alex is the Phillips loss of Falcon mm -hmm. Nine. Um, it's like we could we could put Alex and Philip in like a ring and like have them battle it out. Uh, it'd be great. Someone also yeah, asked you, why it doesn't have any legs or something. Uh, they they don't install the legs or the grip fins at McGregor. That's installed at Florida once at the launch site. Yep. Just there you go. You can see they, they relit it. It fired for a little bit longer. It's cool. and then, yeah. Flames. This is, I, I immediately wonder, is this uh, some sort of profile related to stage separation and the booster yeah. igniting its, its engines? Although, you know, it's hard, it's hard to say. It could be, they could be doing this test for a variety of reasons, um, booster independent of that, but it certainly makes me, makes you think, you know, it seems like they're, they're doing more, um, more and more testing that would be pertinent for the boost. Like they're doing the, um, the testing of the the shrouds on the on the Raptor engines, uh, which would also be sort of a booster centric thing. So a lot of a lot of booster testing potentially going on at McGregor. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Oh, where was that question? Uh, the McGregor question. Let's see. Oh, I just tossed them into the end of the queue. Oh, here it is. Uh, what's the first mission for the booster that's that was that we just saw tested? Um, what is that slated for? Well, the only thing I know is it's going to fly in November, uh, but there's a lot of customer missions in November. My guess, it's probably going to be some of these GTO satellites that are going to be launching in November. Apart from that, I'm really not sure. As for the Raptor, someone was asking, oh, this is for the landing burn. Well, we don't see a Raptor relighting for a landing burn this quick. It's probably more like from Miko, like it shuts down at Miko, and then it's like the boost back burn. It's usually nine to ten seconds after that. 
might be that what we're testing. Wild speculation, obviously, but yeah, I mean, it might it might have just been that. testing testing relight in general. Um, it could have also been, like you said, testing booster Miko and relight for boost back. Um, That's my thought. Yeah, when I first when I first like saw someone in the in the Discord saying like, "Whoa, they just reignited the Raptor twice in a row," I was like, "That has to be." For like boost back simulation maybe not an exact simulation of like the timings of a boost back but i feel like something related to that just like okay rapid reignition and i'm sure it's gonna be helpful regardless too but mm. this is like complete speculation uh but how cool would it be if in boca chica we saw a uh we saw like a 33 engine static fire and then like it, it completes and then like nine seconds later, we see like an eight engine static fire or something with the center engine. Like they do a, mm -hmm. a boost back profile. That would be really cool. But that who knows awesome. if, if we'll, I'm just, I'm just sitting here like throwing pennies into the, into the wishing well. Uh, it's not actually <laughs> something we think is going to happen here. Um, really quick. I do want to thank some of the super chats and whatnot coming through. Really appreciate everybody's support. Blind boy 64. Um, I think I've played that on Nintendo. Uh, Blind Boy Six does a bad joke. I'm sorry. Blind Boy Sixty Four. <laughs> thank you for the support. They say Ian Fan Club. Indeed. I think we're all, Thanks. but not not Hurricane Ian Fan Club. Ian Pineapple. Yeah. Club. I'm not a member of the Hurricane there you go. Fan Club either. Don't worry. Um, Isaac, thank you for the support. They say of all three Falcon Heavy launches scheduled for the end of this year, how many can we expect to launch before 2023? Alex, <laughs> say at least one. Not sure about the other two. There's the Viasat 3 America's uh, satellite, which is still undergoing pre-launch testing. So it's like, it's not even ready yet. And then there's like a DOD mission for the US, for the Space Force on December 2. But I have no idea if it's on track or anything because it's a DOD mission. We, we actually don't really fully know the, uh, the other one, which is this month now, it's, it's already October, yay. Um, should be by the end of this month, the USSF 44 mission. And other than we've seen the boosters at the hangar, other than that, we have no idea. <laughs> so it's, it's not really, really something that they say, hey, we're going to launch in two months or something. It's not something that they publicly talk about too much. It's more like when they are closer to launch, that's when they start all the, the fanfare and everything. All that. That's yeah. uh... That's a classified uh, payload, right? That's why. Yeah, yeah. It it usually it, they say something about the payload, like just a few minor details, but they obviously do not tell uh, everything about the the payload. But we know it's going to be going to uh, a geosynchronous orbit. That's actually going to be the first time SpaceX launches anything directly into geostationary uh, orbit instead of being a transfer orbit, which is like an egg-shaped orbit, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it's going to be actually all the way out there in a circular orbit on, on the geo belt. So yeah, that's that's the first time they're going to be doing that. Yeah, they're not going for a geostationary transfer. They're going straight for geostationary. Straight direct, there. Direct insertion. That's why um, they need the Falcon Heavy. It's like you, you actually need the, the extra push to get it all up there. If it, yep. if it were you know Falcon 9, it could only do transfer, not actually all the way there. And Makes Alex, sense. I believe, because you were mentioning about GEO, and that's obviously going to be a very long mission. So with a long, long second stage mission, you'd need to manage your propellants. But we saw in the Crew 5 pictures, I saw people discussing, there you there's go. a second stage in the background that seems to have a gray band around the kerosene tank. Now, we previously saw that being tested on one of the GPS missions, and they were testing that to do thermal management for long duration missions. So Alex, what are your thoughts on that matter? Well, it's it's to be expected for them to to include that because that actually helps the RP one on the second stage to keep to be kept uh, a little bit warmer because of the long coast. It's it's sort of called the 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 extended the uh, extended coast kit or something like that. It's mm. mission extension kit or something like that. It's. It's not only the RP-1 tank being painted gray, I believe it also includes a couple of more CUPVs, for example, for helium, for RCS thrusters and pressurization, just to keep it all, you know, be able to to last all the way out there um, in the geo bell. It, it takes six hours to get there and then they have to relight the engine again after six hours just being in the cold 
of the space. It's, it, it, it's really a challenging mission in that, in that sense. But, you know, eventually, one day, they have to do that with the Starship, where it goes all the way to yeah. Mars. It's not going to be six hours. It's going to be six months. And they're going to have to go all the way out there. And so this actually kind of helps in that sense to be able to learn a little bit of how cryogenics, obviously the RP-1 is not cryogenic, but the liquid oxygen is. So that kind of also helps them learn a little bit of how that um, behaves in, in space for a relatively long period of time. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I love the, the gray band, just like from an aesthetic point of view, I think it looks yes. really cool. Um, so I'm, I'm all here for it. And I feel like, um, just recently, we were talking in one of the discords that we're in uh, about like, oh, is that, is that gray band ever going to appear again? And sure enough, it appeared again, uh, which is pretty nifty. Yep. It's back, baby. I'm um, excited to see it on Falcon Heavy. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to picture it in my mind. That's going to look so interesting to see on it. Yeah, sure enough. Uh, Jonathan Petsch, thank you for becoming a Capcom member. Super duper extra appreciate that. And we hope you appreciate the various member perks that you get at that support level, including Discord access. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, you get you get to access to our member Discord at Capcom level and above. You also get all the other good stuff uh, from the lower levels of support below Capcom. You get the member preview videos and the behind the scenes stuff and the members only streams and all that kind of cool. Uh, nonsense that we put up there for your consumption and we hope you enjoy it and we so so appreciate all of our members because we could not do what we do without y'all support so thank you so much and also space pony gifted a red team membership so if you got that gifted red team membership from space pony you are a lucky i don't even know what's a what do you call someone that rides a pony you are a lucky equestrian um, that should be, that should be a Western. question for <laughs> for Chris. <laughs> yeah, I'm expecting Chris to to at me right now and, and <laughs> let me know what I've what exactly I've done or said wrong. Oh, he pops up that? right behind you and corrects you. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and then he says dirty leads and then disappears. <laughs> uh, it's October. It's yeah, it's October. It's on brand. Um, let's see here. A lot of comments about my beard. Yes, I have a beard. Thank you everybody for the beard comments. Um, Antoine says it looks like I'm waiting to tell you some great wisdom uh, bacon is delicious that is your wisdom you do a great Gandalf Halloween costume uh, maybe I should I haven't uh, yeah maybe I, that's, that's not a bad idea something Check with a beard right. obviously would be the, the go to Halloween costume um, he's typing let's see. No, he, yeah, he, uh, jockey you go. okay yeah jockey thank you Crispy um, Gwen is asking the booster that hit the bridge when it was being transported, is that the one that we, that Crew Five is on right now, or is that a different one? Did we touch that earlier? That one, yep. They test they test the heck out of that one just to make sure it it didn't you know it didn't see any sort of weird loads or anything. The mature was okay, and it's clear to go. It's all good. <laughs> good deal. Um, let's see. Paul Kelly is asking, whatever happened to the plans for vertical integration at 39A? I don't think those plans went away. I think they just haven't, they'll build it when they need it, right? Is that is that a fair assessment? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, they haven't, there, there's been no payloads like as of right now that need vertical integration. They just said, hey, we'll do it if you need it for the NSSL contract. And yes, there are payloads that are coming up that are going to require it both under NSSL and probably under NRO as well. Um, so yeah, they just, they haven't built it because they haven't needed it yet. And when they do need it or when they anticipate they'll need it within like, I don't know, 12 months or six months or however long it takes to build it, then they'll start building it. And once we see them start building it, that's a great indicator. Hey, a vertical and in vertically integrated payload is coming up very soon. Sure enough. Um, and then of course now chat is just full of Gandalf references. <laughs> <laughs> you shall not pass. Um, let's see. Here's another Alex question. Java Man's asking, how many boosters does SpaceX have in inventory? Do we know the, the like a number here? Oh boy, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I know them. I just don't know the number right off the top of my head. I could just count them right now, but I we don't have time for that. I'll just say it's about a little bit over a dozen of them. I think. Overall, they have about 20, but there's like six of them that are not being used. Six or eight or, 
yeah, it's it's somewhere around that. It's like 12, 13 that they are in like regular use. And then there are a bunch of them that are like waiting to be flown, especially the Falcon Heavy ones. Ah, poor souls. <laughs> those, <laughs> those, I think they have like four center cores for Falcon Heavy waiting or something like that. And and there's like side boosters. <laughs> they are waiting. <laughs> poor boosters. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, I bet they're just buying extra hangers or building extra hangers just to store them. It wouldn't surprise <laughs> me. I mean, it's something we've talked about in the past, right? Where, you know, if they really want to make these like airliners at a certain point, they're going to need a place to store an entire fleet of them. So, yep. or places, I guess I should say. I mean, I'm hearing, only... Go ahead. I was going to say, it's only going to get worse with Starship and Super Heavy because if you're not storing them vertically, if you're storing them horizontally, you're going to need huge buildings or just able to store them outside, both of which would be very difficult. So might as well get some practice before things get really nasty. Sure enough. Uh, in our back channel, I'm hearing that the Falcon 9 we were talking about earlier on 39A is starting to get frosty. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm looking at that now. It should be approaching the, the 20 minute vent. In about yeah, 20 three if minutes. it's going at four 20 minute event would be at 340 right so we have like you said we're, we're minutes away so we'll keep our eyes on that for sure um let's see jay here's a fun one james atkinson is asking do you think spacex will fly boosters until a failure or do you think they will retire units first i think a little bit of both that's me and we'll go around the horn i think i think they'll they'll continue to fly uh, until they have a reason to not. Um, and there will be boosters that through the course of that, they would decide, okay, this booster is done. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they've hit a hard limit. They just hit a limit for that particular booster. But it wouldn't surprise me if sometime in the next year or two or three uh, or more, there is a like Starlink launch on a 38 time flown booster and the booster goes pop and they'd say, oh, it was you know because of X or Y. Um, but yeah, I don't know. What, what do you guys think? Ian, go first. I think, yeah, I think it's going to be a mix of both. I think honestly what they're going to do once they start, um, hitting higher and higher number of milestones, I think they're going to continue doing Starlink launches as their, um, kind of fleet leader launches. Um, and I think eventually it'll get to a point where they're either like, okay, let's see what we can do with this booster or maybe, okay, this booster is we had to put a lot more work into this booster to refurbish it than it was even worth. Let's just toss it out. Let's, let's fly one last flight and get out of there because I assume at some point they're going to hit a mark kind of like where the lines overlap of the cost to refurbish a booster and the cost that you're getting out of it. Eventually you're going to get to a point where you'd have to like replace a tank or you'd have to replace like the thrust structure. And like, that would take too much time, too much work, too much money. And eventually they're going to hit that point. I think just, just guessing, but I think, and then once they hit that point, they're going to have to just start tossing them out on expendable flights. Michael in chat says, we need a booster hall of fame. I think we do. I think that would be yeah. a, a really good thing to have. <laughs> yeah. And also, you know, they're not going to fly them until failure at launch. So if they know that they see anything on the booster that might fail during launch, they're not, they're not going to launch that that way like there's no way they will basically yeah. launch even if it's a starlink satellites even especially now that they're kind of you know wanting more satellites up in orbit kind of makes sense to just not have any failure during launch if the booster fails on landing that might be okay like well you know it lived for a long time it ended you know doing its work so it's cool but if they know there's any issue with the booster that might prevent it to to fly safely into orbit, well, not booster itself, but like doing the mission. Uh, there's the oh, 30 minus 20 minute vent. There, we go. there you go. We're going for a uh, fire. Everything progressing right, right on the dot. That's nice. But yeah, I was, as I was saying, if there's anything that can prevent the, the mission to be fulfilled, I don't think that they will fly those boosters because it's like, it doesn't make sense. If you know it's gonna, it, or you know, you have a high chance of, of it fail, uh, you obviously don't fly it because doesn't make sense right now if you think it might fail more likely on the landing well fly it and then if it if it fails landing eh, it's okay i mean they have a bunch of boosters and they're introducing new boosters so no biggie 
Yeah, sure enough. Yeah. Ian, is James related to you? Is this like your long lost twin? Maybe. <laughs> long lost twin. I don't think so. <laughs> but I've only met a few Atkinsons. The last name's kind of uncommon in America, but it's a solid also, last name. Thank you. I agree. And it's weird. There was some guy named Atkin and he had a son. And they're like, what do we name him? Atkin's son. <laughs> Works. <laughs> That was de- definitely is what happened. But to yeah, add on to totally. what Alex was saying regarding just like real quick, I think if if it got to the point where they're like, okay, I don't think they ever get to the, get to the point where like, okay, this might fail. Let's launch it because best case scenario there, it would fail in flight and say like, you're like, you know, two minutes and it falls into the ocean harmless. Worst case scenario, you have an explosion on the pad or a pad fallback and boom, you just lost your launch pad. So I, I don't really think that flying them until failure on purpose is really a safe thing to do, both from a monetary standpoint, because of course you're losing money, you're losing the satellites, you're losing the second stage, you might lose your launch pad. We don't know how much money they spent to refurb pad 40 after AMO 6, but it almost certainly was a lot of money. And it was, it was a, a lot, lot of time. Downtime. Yes, it was, yeah. exactly. And if they're down to just one pad on the East Coast, they're kind of screwed, especially if they lose pad 39A. There is a lot of problems at that point. So I don't think it would be very wise to fly until failure. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to fly without risk because of course, every new flight you do of a booster is going to be a bit of a risk, but I don't think they're going to take any unnecessary risks out of that. Might and also sense. on the downtime, it's just not the pad, for example, it's also the fleet entirely because they will stop. They, they have had issues in the past where just one engine failed on flight. Like I think it was in 2020, there was one flight where one engine failed in flight and the booster was lost, but the mission was carried out perfectly because, you know, Falcon 9 has engine out capability. Uh, but because of that engine failure, they stopped for like a month just to be able to make sure that that didn't repeat uh, on later flights. And so, you know, when AMO 6 happened in 2016, their cadence was like once or maybe twice at most every month. Uh, right now, if they stop for four months as they stopped back then, that's what, like 20, 30 launches yeah. that they do in four months? It's crazy. Yeah. If they stop for a few months or even just one month, it's like a handful or maybe six or even seven launches that they cannot do. And right now they're dead on with this super cadence of launching, 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 launching. Just this week, we have three launches. We have tomorrow, there's a Starlink launch from Vandenberg. There's a crew launch on Wednesday and there's a satellite launch on Thursday. So it's like, there's three launches this week already. So it's crazy. If they stop for just one month, they they, they will totally not do that. It's it's obviously not not gonna happen. Sure enough. Um, that would be, yeah, that would be devastating to their cadence. Um, let's see here. I think we can move on. As we wait for the static fire here in the next 15 minutes-ish, um, I'm <laughs> messing with us. Let's move on. Let's talk about static fire. Let's move on. Um, what, is, what is it? A check. Oh, it's a check mark. Got it. Yeah, thank oh. you. As we, as we wait for that, uh, let's talk about probably the coolest thing that happened this week or one of the coolest things that happened this week because there was multiple cool things. Um, Dart, the, the, the revenge for the dinosaurs that we <laughs> conducted. Uh, and yeah, I mean... There's so many things I want to say about this. It felt like a Mars landing. It felt like a big deal um, because it was a big deal. And yeah, I mean, we, if you guys were living under a rock or an asteroid um, and you didn't know, <laughs> we did an amazing, amazing live stream. And by we, I mean Dots and Alicia. Um, it was absolutely phenomenal. We had uh, was his name Alan? I'm trying to remember. Look really closely. Andy, thank you. And we had Andy, uh, one of the principal investigators, on stream during impact, basically live reacting to the images as they came in. And it was just, it was a good old time. I think in our back channel, I called it like, it was like an information party. Like it was a party atmosphere because we were all excited. We we're getting new science, but it was also like, you know, not just like a woo party. Like we actually got a lot of information out of it too. So uh, just quick plug: if you haven't if you haven't watched that stream, go back and watch that stream because that is it's absolutely amazing. the coolest way you can consume uh, Dart's impact. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, what do we what do we want to say about about this? I mean, it was obviously a huge a huge milestone uh, in our own ability to potentially, you know, redirect an asteroid in case of uh, an asteroid happening to threaten Earth. You know, if we catch it early enough and we can sort of manipulate its orbit a little bit so it deviates slowly over time and doesn't hit like this is good. This is the first time we've done any, any kind of test like this, right? Yep. This is not the first time that we've crashed into an asteroid, but it is the first time that we've crashed into one to specifically measure the deflection, the change in orbit, um, and the effects of it. So big mission. Very big. Yeah. Super, super duper happy to see it all like work without a hitch. It was just absolutely I mean, it was just so cool to see. And then each each individual picture coming in and uh, sort of being more mind blowing than the picture before it, it and then culminating in uh, culminating in the red box that you see there was just it was just wild. What a yep. what a what an achievement. It, it, Take it was, that asteroid. <laughs> <laughs> it was remarkable. And I think one of the biggest things to me one of the most inspiring things, honestly, is that this was not just a NASA mission. Um, yes, of course, it was, you know, a NASA probe, but there was collaboration all around the world. There were telescopes all over the world watching the asteroid, both as it impacted and in the days following. They even had Hubble and Webb um, looking at the asteroid. Uh, they had, like, Webb, the most powerful space telescope we've ever launched, just looking at this asteroid to see what happened. There were so many assets in use here, so many things collaborating. And maybe it's just me getting a bit emotional, like, just seeing all that collaboration, just everyone coming together for something that is, I'd say, absolutely essential for us to have in our arsenal over the next millions of years. Some way to alter the orbit of asteroids to keep Earth and then eventually the Moon and then Mars and wherever else we go safe. It's just something like this, all of us coming together just to work on something like this. That's just so like motivating and like, you know, that's just so nice to see that this, you know, seemingly little mission that matters so much has everyone coming together to get science out of it and to figure out exactly what we can do with this technology now. I, I will say like in terms of all the different types of launches that you can have with a rocket, um, this might be my favorite, even beyond crew launches although there's probably more like they're equal i don't know that if i have a, a one clear-cut favorite but science missions like just pure science missions where we're all going to learn collectively mm -hmm. something new something important and here you go you can see the hubble uh, hubble imagery you were talking about yep um hubble's on the left uh web is on the and right. web yeah beautiful love it yeah, it got it, it got so bright for a second there as all that dust was was ejected or or whatever material was ejected from from the impact, it outshined the parent body. Uh, what is it? It's it's uh, oh god, I always I always get it backwards. Dimorphos is the moon, right? Yes. Uh, or the the tiny asteroid that's yep. orbiting the bigger and one. And Didymos. Yeah, Thank Didymos you. is yeah. the big one. It was actually cool seeing some of the post impact pictures, like not just right after the impact, but like a few days after, and it left a tail on the asteroid. It was really cool because yeah. ejecta is still like all the debris is still like coming out of the of the asteroid because it was like a mess. I, 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 I'm really looking forward to this. Actually, a European mission in a few years from now, mm -hmm. uh, Hera is going to be going to that, to the double asteroid. It's going to come near that and, and it's going to take pictures of the aftermath. So I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, it's a little bit of a pity that that mission didn't come by a little bit sooner because it will have been cool to actually have it, you know, next to DART. So instead of having the Lisha Cube uh, collaboration with, I mean, it's still cool that we had the CubeSat thing, but it will have been cooler if, if right away after DART impacts, then we have another vehicle to just orbits there and everything. Well, you know, with all the, the dust and everything kicked up, maybe not the ideal thing, but yeah. yeah. I just thought of that. Maybe give us some time to let all the dust spread out. So yeah. Just <laughs> ramming into a dust cloud. I mean, I mean, even, even though we have to wait a little while for that spacecraft to get there and do the observation, uh, at least like, like we were saying, Ian, basically every, like everybody with a telescope on Earth or in orbit was pointing it at, at uh, the asteroid. Yep. So we still got some cool stuff like right off the bat. Um, we have. I, oh. I was going to say. Oh, there you I, go. There, yeah, the, that's the, era, the, the, the Lycia cubes. 
uh, photos. <laughs> yeah. I love how Doss is correcting us. He's like, yep, you got it. Did Doss get like a new uh, drawing tablet or something? Like he's he's draw happy today. I better not <laughs> I better not say anything mean about him or he's gonna draw a mustache on. Oh wait, I already have one. He'll uh, draw like a little wait. dunce hat. Okay, let's see. Because, because I can. I can. That's what gonna say. Oh, I can't talk. I oh, can't talk. Okay. Oh. oh yeah, it's true. He can <laughs> talk. So he's okay. writing. <laughs> I'm not talking. <laughs> <laughs> but you're writing this, so that's all right. This counts. is great. Yeah, There's people is... asking about the the change in the orbit. Whether we we know anything about that, I don't think they have released any data on that. Uh, yeah, Tony, it's going to take Tony a Jepson little bit. Just asked, have we seen any delta v numbers for Didymos yet? Hmm. Uh, I don't think we have. Bit. Yeah. If he... you watch the stream, they said it might take a couple months because yeah. that's the the nature of how they're analyzing things. Um, but we'll we'll surely find out uh, here we might, soonish. Yeah, we might get something <laughs> preliminary within two weeks. That's sort of what they said as well, because the orbit, the, the way that they actually see it is the the small one is is like orbiting, and you can see the 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 occultation of one by the other, and you can actually measure the period of that, and that's the the period of the orbit. And as you can see with that. Uh, you need multiple passes to actually gather enough data to actually see like the decrease. It's a small decrease in just, uh, I think they were expecting at least a minute of difference in the, in the orbit. In the orbit, it's like 11 hours. So you need, obviously because it's 11 hours in just two days, you may see only like four and a half laps around the, the big one. And we're only a week from that. So there's not been many, many laps, many, many orbits to gather enough data uh, about it. And as Das is pointing out, you can read more about that, obviously, on nasaspaceflight.com because Hagen Warren, uh, senior science writer and all the things, <laughs> he made a really, really, really great, uh, a really, really great article about that. Yeah, nasaspaceflight.com. <laughs> Darts and successfully slams into our straight. There you go. <laughs> yeah, and Hagen's Hagen's excitement about this mission was like, it, it was amazing. Um, in in Discord, he. Go ahead. I was gonna say his excitement about any scientific mission is just so contagious. Yes, it was amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, it was amazing. Uh, cool. Hagen. So, so let's see. Is that Dart? Um, do we have any other Dart questions we want to touch on? I I can't. I can't underscore enough how cool of a live stream that was. It was absolutely amazing. Um, Andy Chang, the chief scientist for planetary defense at John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. He's he's the guy that was watching live with us and Alicia. He's the guy that came up with the idea to try and and uh, you know alter the trajectory of an asteroid in this way. And he is the, the one sitting there sort of reacting to, to what's going on on screen. So just once again, if you haven't watched that, um, that stream, go check it out because holy cow, it's amazing. Uh, cannot recommend enough. Um, yeah, there you go. That's what it looked like. Yeah, that guy, it's yeah, it was amazing. It's like it was absolutely amazing. That guy. <laughs> yeah, I love it. One point was too. Super He's, cool. He was like, "I'm not gonna say. I'm not gonna say what I what I'm thinking. I'm not gonna say." And then, in like 30 seconds later, he's like, "It looks lumpy." <laughs> I'm like, "You said it. You said what you were thinking." Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was oh. that was awesome. It was, it, it was awesome. It was so cool to actually have the you know the the guy that came up with that with that idea and and be live you know checking on the on the pictures and everything. It was uh ah, it was really cool. Yeah. And it's like normally you know normally we get all of that stuff filtered through uh, like press releases and very like regimented and professionalized interactions and it's very like stilted and like well this is the thing we're very good we're very glad that the thing happened but no like no this was in true nasa space flight fashion just like a live reaction and excitement and uh, yeah anyways i i think uh, i think check is the idea um but yeah that was dark i'm super happy to get some more science under our belts and to learn more about our solar system and how about uh is it does anyone have any dark questions they want to they want to hit before we move on Taking a look, mm. I can't see any. Not that I know, apart from the from the question of whether we know the deflection and things like that. 
Yep. Yep. Which we don't get. Cool. All right. Let's I move think on. And someone said if there was any other mission like this. I think the Chinese are also planning something like this as well. But okay. later down the line, it's cool to have like multiple countries to be able to do this as well, just in case. But, well, and that's yeah. that's science as well, right? You don't do something yeah. once and then proclaim that you know everything. You do it again. You repeat it. You have someone else repeat the experiment and yep. come to the same results. And that's and it, how you how you verify yeah. a hypothesis. And, and it mean, may not be with this double asteroid. It might be with another one. So it, yep. it's kind of like another set of data. Or even a single asteroid. See what it's like with that. And then, yeah, the thing about science is that you you can't have just one result and say, okay, this is proven. This is fact. You need to have someone completely different do a similar experiment and then you compare your results and then from there you can start to build on ideas i'm looking here on my clock and i think we are yeah, we're moments the away fire test yeah we are moments like, away from the static fire so let's keep our eyes on that yep. um and I, I mean i guess while we're waiting for that static <laughs> fire is that is that a good time for us to talk okay. about uh <laughs> polaris Wait, what, did, what did you write on screen i didn't see it I think he said, okay. <laughs> okay, got it. I mean, I think this is a good time to discuss Polaris because it involves a spacecraft we're looking at right now. And even the the booster, as I said before, Chad once hinted that this might be the booster for Polaris Dawn, the first mission of the program. So maybe we actually see this booster fly uh, next year on that mission. Yeah. So it's All kind right, of so fitting. Who, so we're like three minutes away or like two minutes away from from Falcon 9 doing a static fire here. So uh, we'll obviously you know, keep our eyes on that as we're talking. But um, yeah, I don't know who wants to, to give like a, a 10,000 foot view of this, of this announcement with uh, the Hubble reboost in Polaris. I could take it. I'd be down. Go for it. Let's go. Yeah, All go right. for so it. SpaceX and NASA are doing a study. I would like to say, first off, this is a study because there is a lot of not mis 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 misunderstandings, I should say, about what this was. So they are studying, without any money being exchanged, the possibility of SpaceX doing a reboost mission to the Hubble Space Telescope. Mm -hmm. um, so the Hubble Space Telescope, as we all know, was launched by the Space Shuttle back in the 19, oh crap, 1990s. Um, and it, it, had so it had several shuttle servicing missions, which came up, replaced instruments, reboosted the telescope a bit. But the shuttle doesn't fly anymore. That's the problem right now. So there's no spacecraft purpose built to repair Hubble. Um, and Hubble is in a relatively high orbit, I think around 530 kilometers. So it's a... <laughs> <laughs> there you so go. It's, it's, it just... it's in a higher low Earth orbit. Um, and right now, if they let Hubble go as it was, it would last until about 2037 is when it would naturally decay and deorbit, which is still a good bit of time from right now. But I mean, you want it to last forever. So what they are looking into, again, looking into, they have not confirmed anything, is the possibility of reboosting Hubble using a Crew Dragon spacecraft. Um, there's no confirmation on what mission this would be. Uh, they said that there, if it, if it, if it did, if, excuse me, if they did choose to go forward with it, it would likely be the second Polaris mission, um, which we have not heard any information about actually. So that would line up pretty well. Um, so yeah, they would be docking a crew dragon backwards actually. And I think we have, I don't know if we are able to show it right now, but we do have a nice render from Mac. Uh, it, that's very, yeah, we'll, yeah, not at yeah, we'll, 60 seconds. We'll show it here in a minute. Um, yep. and and actually speaking, as we get like moments away from static fire, I just do want to mention that we don't have a microphone out there. Uh, that is due to the hurricane. We delayed deploying a, a mic uh, because, you know, Hurricane Ian, as we talked about at the start of this stream. So, uh, so don't fret, even though we're talking about what's going on and other things, we're not going to, oh, there it was, yeah. <laughs> Oh, we'll show on. it. We'll show it more in a little bit, but uh, I swear it's not me, it's Das. But yeah, that's uh, that oh. is what's going on. Don't do not expect to hear. And there we go, static fire. There you go. Time. Beautiful static fire. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> Whoosh. <laughs> Rumbling sounds. They cannot hear that. <laughs> Rumbling sounds intensify. That was a pretty long static there part. It looked go. like the seven second one. I always love seeing that plume. It's just like, I don't know. It gives me shuttle vibes. And now you there, can we, watch those we said all shuttle. the time on Space Coast Live. That's true. 
now that we have Space Coast Live. And soon there will be a mic, so you'll be able to hear it as well. Yeah, we saw it roll out. We saw the, the rocket go vertical. We saw everything. And now we're seeing the static fire test. We have to wait for SpaceX to confirm a quick good look on that static fire test. And tomorrow, they're going to be doing a launch readers review uh, with NASA to sort of like uh, see if all the data looks good and go ahead with launch on Wednesday. Hooray. Cool. So that looked good. And like you said, we'll wait to see what SpaceX says. They usually do like a, like a customary tweet, right? They'll do it's like, mm. static fire looked good. And we'll all be like, yay. They're like, uh, looks good. <laughs> Let's just look at the data. Uh, it, it's, it's okay. Cool deal. Um, so yeah, we were talking about Polaris and the Hubble reboost mission study um let's see we do have some questions and there's the image that ian was talking about and it's yeah. being expanded real time as you can see Absolutely. one thing that i one thing that i do hope though it's like that capsule needs to be endeavor because the first uh set of service mission to hubble was endeavor and it needs to be endeavor crew jaguar endeavor <laughs> endeavor <laughs> there you go nice <laughs> <laughs> nice, uh, nice native merch plug there. Um, Obviously. <laughs> and this image looks weird to most people, including me. And yep. when I first saw it, I'm like, what am I looking at here? This is horrible. Because you would imagine the docking ports at the front, the part facing exactly away from the telescope. But Jared Isaacman said on Twitter, I think someone made a, a, a render sort of like this or, or with, with Dragon docked front on double. And yeah, Jared said, you might want to flip Dragon 180 degrees. So it yeah. seems like they'll have some sort of uh, docking adapter in the trunk of Dragon. And that would make sense because the uh, docking adapter on Hubble is not the same one that Dragon uses. And I assume it would be a pain in the butt to change the docking adapter on Dragon. So they'll probably just have some kind of like truss in the trunk that'll just lock onto Hubble. Um, and then they'll use the deorbit thrusters right on the front of Dragon there to push it into a higher orbit. We it kind of makes sense that, that they Wait. do it this way. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, if they're doing an EVA to do servicing, are they going to go out the side hatch or the top hatch? The top. The Probably the top hatch, yeah. yeah. So, Just like, so yet another reason yeah. why they would want to dock this way, because if you docked the top in, then you would be you would have no way to get out of the... What is the little ladder? Are you drawing oh, Kerbal? Is Doss oh drawing God. Kerbal parts? I'm pretty sure I use that, <laughs> that ladder and like, the all fins. the time. Yeah. Yep. KSP. There you go. I, love I that. mean, that handrail's already on Hubble because it was designed to be able to, to be uh, refurbished. But I guess they will have to include some of those on the trunk. I think for Polaris Dawn, they're going to include some of those. I'm not fully sure, but I kind of heard I that in so. passing. Yeah, I, I, mean, I heard those things like in passing. Maybe they'll do that again here. I mean, I could see them doing something like a, a spring-loaded deployable ladder. So it's like it's all folded up kind of like, a, I don't even know what to describe, but then like it kind of like, you know, unfolds like, whoop, and then it kind of unfolds down the side <laughs> like that. Yeah. Oh. That's the other one. <laughs> Dasa's just literally drawing Kerbal Space Program parts. I would uh, love myself. What is that, that the, what is that the TELUS mobility enhancer or something like that? Yeah, yep, perfect. Exactly. Something along the lines, yeah. Um. <laughs> the check marks i feel like i'm in <laughs> in like middle school again like you, you you passed your spelling test check um oh my gosh <laughs> well see that's the night you're, you're breaking up the illusion because it should it should actually say like 75 try harder next time um thank you das uh <laughs> jesse marr wow upgrading to flight engineer thank you wow. so much jesse marr uh fun fact one of the perks you get at flight engineer level is your name at the end of NASA Spaceflight Live episodes. I don't think we have a list have, this big. Yeah, wow. I don't think we have the capability to show your name on the card oh, there this you go. week, but that's, yeah, you just added yourself to this, uh, this list here. So thank you so much, Jesse, for upgrading your membership level. We super duper appreciate it. Um, okay, let's, uh, we do have a lot to cover, so let's keep things rolling here. Um, 
Tony is asking, apart from replacing three broken gyroscopes, do you think they will do any other upgrades? I mean, maybe they'll like paint like a sweet racing stripe on it or something. I'm giving, <laughs> I'm giving Doss another opportunity to draw here. Uh, I... it... There you go. <laughs> <laughs> It'll make it go faster. Uh, but what do we, what do we think? I mean, what else could they could they like replace maybe some camera hardware or some electronics <laughs> or something to make it even even more better? Or uh, or is that sort of probably out of the scope here? It's kind of hard. Uh, I think Chris, uh, prior to the to the conference, he tweeted like what it looked like with with the shuttle, how to to service Hubble, and many of the components are really really big, and you kind of need uh, a good way to access the 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 payload base section of the Hubble. Uh, not from that side, Das. So it's like, no. <laughs> Actually, being in that side, oh, come on, being on that side will be very, very dangerous for the for a telescope. That that thing has to close, uh, in a, in order to to do the the servicing, uh, because that's where all the mirrors are, and so you can damage. Um, so so yeah, you you will have to access the instruments. You have to be careful, like the doors. Uh, I think Wayne Hale went on, on on Twitter and said, you know, when we did that on on shuttle, it was really really like the the astronauts did not like those missions because it was like you have to be very very careful and to just to to not damage anything. Um, so I, I don't know how you could do that being careful with Dragon, com considering it doesn't have all the hardware and equipment of shuttle. But you know, yeah, it doesn't even have like a like a robotic arm or something that no. they can like. Yeah. That's it's gonna be it's gonna be tricky. But even just I'm, even I'm just taking the Hubble and so. boosting it to a higher orbit is a pretty big win, right? Even just yeah. moving it to a more stable, higher up orbit, right? If this works, though, I'm kind of thinking of another vehicle coming soon online that you took the might... words out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah, but are you talking have, about? Uh... Are you talking about Jarvis? Yes, I'm talking about Jarvis. He was talking no, about Terran not. R, actually, Jack. Yeah. Way to be so assumptive. <laughs> of course, you're talking about Starship. Yeah, I'm talking about Starship. It obviously has a lot of payload cap uh, volume and capability. Um, so it will be a very, very good way to, you know, to once they prove that, you know, Crew Dragon can do all of that stuff, maybe later down the line, we can send Starship to just upgrade uh, at least the mm -hmm. gyros. The gyros will not be able to fit. I don't think they even fit on the trunk. I think they're like, uh, oh, well. I mean, they might be able to. The only problem is, is you're docking. You're you're docking to the to the hovel, so it's like actually not. They're not that big. And yeah, the gyros are pretty but, small. It's the actual instruments. Yeah, it's the instrument. The, they might the, the be... yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. I was going to say they might be able to fit like one instrument inside the trunk. Yeah. But then you couldn't have so, your docking adapter. And even exactly, if you did, you're you wouldn't dock. be able to access it. <laughs> so you'd bring the instrument up, you would trap it against Hubble and then leave with that and then leave with the instrument. And you go so what, like put a it couple inside. a couple trombones yeah. or something, maybe like a trumpet or like a set oh of drums. <laughs> I mean, you you could probably store it inside of Dragon, but you may not be able to get it out because of the hatch <laughs> size. It you wouldn't even like, get it in. Oh uh, yeah. Well, that's true. You get out. Yeah, if you cannot get it out, you can all get it in. But oh, geez. Yeah. Like yeah. you were saying with Starship, that would be, well, I mean, then you kind of, well, never mind. I was about to say you run into the issue of why not just launch a bigger one with a Starship, but that is very expensive. So, you yeah, know, they could, they could like build a new instrument on the ground, bring it up with Starship dock, because I think we've heard, yeah, maybe it was just rumors that there's like they're working on robotic arms for Starship. Again, that might be a rumor. That might be, I might be making it up in my head, but that would be cool. Yeah, if they could just grab onto Star, uh, to grab onto Hubble, hold it in place, and have some astronauts just do like some instrument replacing, solar panels, and then reboost it a bit, and then come back. App dude in chat is saying this is why the shuttle was so amazing. It just had the payload bay right there, and the, like the yeah. payload bay right there, the arm just hanging out, so that you could mount a person to the arm and then move the arm into the right place, and then. Not only that, like I constantly think about how when you're in space, you don't have anything to push against. So if you're trying to like yank on something or push something into place, you're it's like the what is it the law what Newton one of Newton's laws of motions. Like you're just gonna push yourself around because. Yeah. But if you're attached to the arm and if your feet are in the little restraints on the arm, then you have like a little bit of ability to actually manipulate things. Um, but yeah, I think 
I think we're set there. Uh, boop, boop, boop. Well, Tony... SpaceX has built arms. It's true. Not, yep. not this kind of arm. <laughs> I mean, heck, just contract with the same company that built Canada Arm and uh, throw one on Starship. Canada. Um, yeah. Well, Tony Jebson is asking: Is there any consumables on Hubble that need replenishing? Like, maybe uh, refuel it somehow? Is that a thing? I have There's no idea. No propellant on Hubble. Yeah, there's no propellant. It's, it's all gyroscopes, right? It's yeah. all gyroscopes. It's just a big dead mass just floating around. That's why they need to reboost it because there's no way for it to be boosted. And actually, that's the reason why they put the docking adapter on there in the first place was to deorbit it. Because again, Hubble can't deorbit itself. And they're like, hey, let's put this on here. Maybe someday we can build a deorbit craft if we need to just to dock on and deorbit it. But now it's being used for the opposite purpose, thankfully. Actually... Airvale in chat says, when star arm, and then they corrected themselves to call it Starm. Star which I Starm. We're gonna have to come up with the we're gonna have to come up with a backronym to make Starm actually uh, uh like an uh, like, yeah, that's this is amazing. Uh, the good, star good with the star shoulder and the star yeah. The, star, the starship, starship Starship technical arm for repair missions. Wow. Wow, Ian. I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty impressed. I go. got I I can't even uh <laughs> Wow. Um, Remy Turk, thank you so much. They say, uh, does, do NASA spacesuits fit through Dragon's Hatch or would Polaris 1 be kind of the EVA and suit rehearsal? Uh, I think that, right? I don't know. That's, that, that would make sense to me. Yes, I think mm. so. It will be SpaceX's own suits, yeah. Because the, the, the EVA suits that NASA uses, those do not fit through the hatch. They fit when you have like the separate pieces. So if you want to bring one bag, for example, that's okay because you can like, you have different pieces, but if you wear one and you try to, to go through the hatch, you cannot do that. So um, you wouldn't be able to, to actually go through the hatch with a suit on. Uh, the, the suit itself can fit in, in the different parts, but not entirely through it. Yeah, and in this context, it makes a lot of sense for Polaris Dawn to be testing EVA stuff because you know it's 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 it would be building on the testing they do on the first mission if they actually end up doing something with Hubble other than just reboosting it and needing to do an EVA to accomplish that, then they've already practiced that a little bit. So very cool, very cool stuff. I cannot wait um, until we see that. Oh gosh. Yeah, it's it what a cool what a cool announcement. Um and what a cool potential mission. Hopefully the study that they're doing works out and uh, we get to see some action based on it uh, sometime in the future. But we are talking about Starship and the Star Arm or Starm or what, <laughs> wait, what, what was it? Do, do, you, do you remember what the acronym was? Cause I've already forgotten it. The Starship Techno, uh, I, I found a better one. The Starship Transpositional Arm for Repair Missions. Love it. What is happening? He's drawing a Trogdor arm. It's gonna go around the countryside <laughs> and burn and the villagers. It's fine, it's normal, yeah. Yeah, you got like some cool flames going. You got like uh, some some grass fire happening over whether. Yeah, it's fine. It's everything. He just grasps Hubble and crushes it like a like a soda can <laughs> and it just flies off. <laughs> I made it better. All right, bye. Uh, um, very cool. All right, so Starship. Speaking of Starship, Starship hey. Twenty Four was lifted off of Pad B. Um, what do we think is going on here? Some kind of like repairs or something? Uh, Alex, what what? Did, how do you brain this? Oh well, they they spent a few weeks with with a crane holding ship twenty four, and they shut the 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 door on the payload bay section. They closed it. Uh, it seems like it is for good. Like it's not gonna be used on. Like the they flight. didn't. It wasn't. It wasn't open, and then they closed the door. Like they literally like put something yeah, over it. But right? yeah, put, they they put a like I don't know some plate on top of it. They welded it, and now it's closed for good. It's not gonna be used. Uh, because obviously it's close so they cannot use it um and, and and yeah they they moved that little bit to the to the um overall launch site and we're expecting them to stack this ship on top of the of booster seven which is currently at the mega bay we expect that to be happening soon ish like you know elon time kind of kind of stuff um but that's sort of probably not the 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 next thing that they're gonna do they might have any sort of other things going on in between but like the major thing the major next thing that we're looking at it's likely going to be that stacking of ship 24 on top of booster 7 
And, and so they moved down there, uh, the ship, and probably they're going to be spending a few more days, maybe a, a week or two. We don't know the timelines again, so oh, who knows? Um, they might be a, a spending a, a little bit of time there with the with basically all the, the TPS work, uh, kind of feeding the, the ship to be able to to already be stacked on the booster and not have to deal with that. But you know, maybe they just do a stacking that is like not all the way to launch, even though they probably will like that or you know Elon might want that to happen. But if they are in a hurry to get and test data and, and everything, as you will say, Jack, more data, more better. Um, Quit stealing my bit. <laughs> yeah. So my bit. Don't steal my bit. <laughs> you you can think that that they will probably stack it and like, okay, this is good enough for a stacking and static fire tests and things like that, and you know, wet jersey hustle and everything. And maybe then then later in like three or four or four weeks, like in a month or so, they they destack it, work a bit on it again, and then they put it back and just launch it. That could also be a thing. Who knows? Um, so we shouldn't be expecting this to be just the the end of everything. Like, oh, it's already stacked. It's so it's ready. There's many tests going down. I'm seeing a lot of people already excited that right away they're gonna do the 33 engine static fire. I do not think that's gonna be the case. Uh, that's probably one of the major tests that we're seeing. Uh, but I do not think it's gonna be the next thing that we're gonna see. I'm not. I'm I'm not 100 sure that's gonna be the thing that we're gonna see next. Right. So. so Booster 7, the, its robustness upgrades uh, should be completing soon, and we expect it to roll back to the launch site, and then probably Ship 24 being stacked on top of it. Um, but like you said, that's not necessarily like, it's going to fly next week, it's ready to go, it's stacked. Uh, but either way, yeah. it's going to be super exciting to see a full stack once again, because the full stack Starship looks awesome. It I looks mean, come cool. On. What were you going to say, yeah. Ian? Sorry. Um, I was just looking at the video we were showing there as Ship 24 was rolling away, and wow, there's a lot of damaged heat shield tiles on there. I yep. don't know if that's from the Static Fire campaign or maybe like they bumped it with the crane or something. No, I think it's from wow. it's from the Static Fires, if I'm not mistaken. It it definitely took uh, it, it took a beating on that on that most recent six engine Static Fire. I think they've had to do some some yeah. repairs, not just the thermal protection system, but uh, and there's like. If you look at the at like some close-ups of the flaps, like yeah, the under, underside like of the flaps are are seriously uh, like it, you can tell it took it took some damage. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's, now I'm really curious about what's going to happen when they do say a 33 engine static fire with a ship on top. Well, the thing is with that is if the ship is way up on top of the booster, I feel like that's a safer place to be, even though. 33 yeah. engines is a lot of engines. It's also far away from any debris that might be that's a, Yeah, ex that's exactly mm -hmm. what I'm saying. Yeah, because yeah. when it's on suborbital pad B, it's just firing straight into concrete, so and that concrete can spall. And uh, yeah, you it, yep. yeah, you can see the height difference. So it'll be much, much further up off the ground and uh, away from any debris. Thank you, Das, for that. Um, this is like this is like a challenge now. Like I, I'm, try I'm trying to think of funny things I can describe uh, to make DOS draw, like, what if there was a cow on top of Starship? I don't, I don't know. Um, I think SpaceX just <laughs> uh, referencing the the static fire that we saw. Uh, SpaceX has confirmed on Twitter that it's complete, and like that's a quick, good look that they that they usually tweet. Good. All right. Good. Yeah. Then, uh, then we had a good static fire that we saw earlier. Excellent. And that was the tweet we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Um. Yeah very excited cool. to see this test campaign happen and whatever happens with the tiles i mean um yeah and we've discussed in one of our most recent starship update videos uh that there might be some starships coming up without heat shield tiles or without flaps um so even if things don't go well for ship 24 and ship 25 that doesn't necessarily mean the end of or like a huge setback for starship because i think given that they're going to be launching two v or like a vehicle or two or three or however many they're doing um, without flaps or heat shield tiles, I think SpaceX is kind of on board and understanding that, hey, stuff might go wrong here. We're going to take a break from that. And then we'll get back to it later once with an improved solution or something along those lines. So, Yeah. the It's actually being already, I, th I think they, they, they're already stacking or might be preparing for stacking uh, that 
that ship, Ship 26, it's kind of weird. It's like it, it may not even have any payload bay uh, door, for example. So and doesn't have like the pest dispenser. Mm-hmm. It's 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 like it's just gonna be an empty starship uh, without yeah. flaps, without tiles, and you know, uh, Jack, say the word. Uh, it's just like more flights, so it's gonna get more data and everything, and yada yada yada. You know, don't more... steal my bit. Yeah, it's more bit. data, more better, and everything. But you get what I mean. Like like uh, Raptor is is a really young uh, engine. It's nowhere near. Uh, mature right now and so getting flights just for the sake of flying sometimes it's just good because you get more data on how the the vehicle performs and yep. not just uh yeah speaking <laughs> of flights yeah, to pushing orbit, it's oh. pushing a little bit uh, here. yeah uh, when we do firefly. all right all right so we're, we're okay. what is it uh, what is it? produced oh produced nice uh we got produced <laughs> We did. We just, boom, we've been produced. Yeah, so Firefly, yeah. they flew for a second time, successfully reaching orbit for the first time. Yeah. Congratulations, heartfelt congratulations to everybody at Firefly. Um, gotta say, it was a really amazing launch to witness in person, and I just am so thankful for Firefly being such an open and awesome company. They let remote photographers put cameras basically wherever we wanted um it was insane so uh close, they were damaged as well yeah yeah i mean i've <laughs> i've slick 2 is kind of notorious for for damaging lenses and uh for some reason i forgot about that <laughs> 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 uh, uh yeah and so i think michael's cameras took a whole bunch of damage my cameras took a whole bunch of damage but it is what it is it's the that's the nature of rocket photography who cares though they successfully reached orbit and their payloads were deployed and they all talked uh, back to ground stations and it was 100% mission success. So super awesome to see another uh, another launch here come online. I think they successfully deployed um, two CubeSats and a separate deployer containing uh, a number of, of like tiny, tiny sats. I don't even know what you would call those. Like a- Picos, Picosats? Picosats, yeah, Pico, sure. Pico, Pico, I don't know. We yeah, say there was six Pico, Pico in Spanish. Pico but... sats on board, I'd say. Very cool. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, if you guys remember the the first flight of Alpha, it kind of um, went a little squirrely and then went boom. And so this was a like a triumphant return about a year later, uh, about a year later for for Firefly to to sort of get everything all buttoned up. There's a couple launch attempts, and they finally, uh, you know, they tried. It was at the beginning of September. Um, and they had a, they had a, a scrubs, and so now we, we got to uh, we got to actually see the liftoff and see them make it to Who orbit. Photographed this. Um, a camera did. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, the, but the photographer <laughs> did a great job there putting putting that camera. I think. Yeah. It's that's okay. Really, really cool. I bet he's a great guy. No, it's yeah. not okay. It's good. It's cool. It yeah. It's, it's not okay. just one V. It's like multiple Vs, Daz. It could, it, <laughs> it could be. It could be better. I could have uh, set it darker so that it didn't get so blown out. But... Yeah, and it could and it could just not be good, and and we will say it, but it's good. It's cool. It... But yeah, that's, that's definitely. The truth. Thank you again to uh, to Firefly for being so awesome and letting us put cameras everywhere and giving us all the time in the world. Um, everybody got some great shots on this launch. All the remote photographers. Uh, this one is from which one is this one from? Is this Michael. Michael's? Yeah, that's yeah. Michael. Michael got some great shots. Uh, Pauline got some great shots. Like everybody, all all the assembled rocket photographers got some great shots, and it was it was an absolutely those. Okay, fun fact. So you see that tripod right there on the left, and then the one which one? The, <laughs> yeah. The the, <laughs> the the one immediately like the furthest left, right next to the plume. Uh, yeah, that one, and then the one to the right of it. The one to the right, the that one, yep. And then the one that's sideways, the sideways camera. Yep. And then the one to the right of that. Not the big box, but the those are my four cameras. Those are all four oh, of wow. them. And, and three of those fell over. <laughs> that's, not all. That's, that's not all. That's not oh, all. Minus there's, one. There's, there's, this is one more. Yeah. This is uh, that. Yeah. So, anyways, theater of the theater of the mind here. If you're listening to this, I apologize. But yeah, anyways, that's my that's where my cameras were, and they three of those were blown over by uh, <laughs> by the rocket, and then got sandblasted by debris. Ooh. So pa- Pauline posted this, and my immediate reaction was like, "Oh look, it's my cameras!" Before they fell over and got sandblasted by debris. 
Um, <laughs> but it's a cool, it's a really cool shot. And it just goes to show you, like, we got to put cameras right up on the darn thing. It was super cool. And Firefly let us do that. So hopefully uh, we get another launch from them here soon. Ah. And uh, yeah, and I exposed my engine shot properly. So there's not a whole bunch of blown out portions there. That would be great too. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, does anyone have anything else they want to hit on Firefly? Uh, Keith is asking, why is the pad bad for cameras? It's just, there's a lot of gravel that gets kicked up and thrown around. Some pads um, are like, I guess, cleaner for lack of a better word. Slick too, uh, like if you put cameras up close, you're going to take debris. It's sort of the same as Slick 6. Um, there's just like, you're not up on a hill. You're not far away. Like these shots, you're up close. And uh, if, you, if you're up close like that, you're going to take some debris. So um, yeah, yeah I, I mean... They also said that their next launch for Flight 3 is um, coming up by the end of the year. It's going to have a few NASA CubeSats on board. So uh, very cool. They're getting Flight 3 all ready to go. They have a few customers signed on. And yeah, Alpha seems to be... And it's also a very capable vehicle in general. It can get over... I think it's like one ton or 1.2 tons into low Earth orbit, which is a lot for a small rocket. So you could either take a bunch of small payloads or you could take like, you know, a, a medium sized payload up into orbit. Um, so yeah, a lot of capability there. It kind of serves the, oh no, it's not, not really the Delta two, but it, 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 it serves like a, a unique market that is not quite as small as rocket lab, but not quite as big as like Antares or Delta two. Mm. I'm sort of feeling like it's going to be the sweet spot going forward because it's like if you don't need a full Falcon 9, then, you know, maybe you fly on Firefly. Uh, sorry, on Alpha. Or, yep. or Relativity, which also has yeah. turn one. Yep. Because um, it has, it's like, it has about it's like the if, same... you're, if your payload is too big for Electron or some other small, like Launcher 1, for example, but too small for a Falcon 9, it's like this is, might end up being sort of a, a sweet spot here, so... Super duper cool to see Alpha come online and have a hundred percent mission success. I'm and you can. And, oh. oh, I was I was about to mention a few things uh, from Firefly as well that you can actually do ride share on this on, on this one because, uh, like with with a big one maybe you know I don't know like five hundred uh, kilograms or something and then you have like a ring below it with like little ones and and all that you can do that as well and actually Firefly is developing these. Uh, a real transfer vehicle, I think they call it. It's like a tug that you can put it on on Alpha, but you can also put it like on a Falcon 9 or put it, you know, on another kind of bigger rocket that is going like a rat share thing. Uh, and eventually, it's gonna, it's probably gonna be used on their medium launch vehicle, kind of like Beta or uh, whatever yeah. it's called. That it's probably gonna be used for North of Gram, and we'll we'll see. I guess they were also cheering that that they got the the orbital flight good. So. You know that's 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 really sweet. That yeah, you know, I suspect Astra is oh, very happy as well. Would you like to know more? <laughs> Read our article on NASAspaceflight.com. I'm doing my part. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. I just what, is, what happened to Doss today? Like flawless <laughs> victory, Doss. Flawless <laughs> victory. But uh, to your point, Alex, I bet Astra is also fairly happy since they're going to be using uh, the same engines from oh, Firefly. Yeah. So. A yep. lot of a uh, lot of good successes here with this launch. Um, <laughs> let's see. Super chat from Future of Gaming asking if Hubble needed a new computer. Um, I'm not sure about that. And also, how many Starlink sats are in orbit right now? This is a little bit of an older super chat, so slightly off topic, but I did want to mention it. Thank you, Future of Gaming, for the support. Hmm. Alex, do you know how many Starlinks are in orbit right now? Uh, a lot. <laughs> I think, I think there several, are several like, thousand, so like somewhere over three thousand. I think was the last number I saw. I, I can look it up, but I think the last time that I that I updated it, uh, it was three thousand three hundred and ninety something. So it was close Love to it. three hundred three thousand and four hundred. So there you go. Cool. And Brenner Brenner J, thank you for becoming a Pad Rat member. We hope you enjoy your Pad Rat perks, like the members only emoji, which I'm about to spam a whole bunch of Star Hoppers into chat because Star Hopper is the best. Um, cool. Well, uh, I guess, do we want to cover any of these, um, sort of bonus items or how are we on time here? I'm waiting for DOS to draw something like a, a hand pointing at a watch on a wrist. Like we gotta, we gotta go. Um, he will just say no on the screen or something. Yeah, that's a good point. Oh, wait. <laughs> 
<laughs> nah. nah. <laughs> See? <laughs> we have yeah, we are, we are We are a little bit tired oh. on time. Uh, so I think that is what we will do. Uh, we should just wrap it up, huh? Um, let's see here. Just going to make sure I'm not I missing. I think anything. we have a new article. Thank you. That's what, yes. Uh, we have a new Starship Roundup article to answer all your Starship questions. I mean, maybe we didn't get to your question in this, in this uh, episode today, but check out the article. The answer might just be right in there, sitting there waiting for you to, uh, to find it. So For once I didn't do, write this Starship article. <laughs> do your part. That was, that was Chris. So yeah, go, go check it out. Uh, we'll throw the link in chat. Uh, there it is from NASA Space Flight. The link is in the chat. So go check it out. Read the article. Learn more, make your brain bigger, all that good stuff. Um, but I think I think that's it for this week. Um, I definitely want to thank all of our flight engineers and launch director members. And thank you to all of our members. Um, but definitely want to thank the launch directors and flight engineers because that is one of their perks they get is their names at the end of the year. I always make this joke, but it's like, we just need a high frequency burst, uh, like a data burst. It's like, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. like someone, someone read all the names and speed it up and we'll, uh, we'll go from there. But um, seriously, it's, it's a great problem to have that we have so many names on the list, so much support. We would not be able to do what we do without all of y'all's support. Um, between between Star, Star Base Live, Space Coast Live, McGregor Live, and then all of the various other random live streams that we do, plus the video production, plus just uh, all the coverage on the news site, just everything so, so important that uh, the members give us their support like they do. So thank you. If you have never considered being a member, the little sign up button is right down there. Um, so go, go check it out, find a perk that you like and jump into the membership level you can afford. Oh, really quickly before we go, Joe, thank you for the oh. very generous super chat. They say, thank you for feeding our respect for those in physics and reaching. You feed our passion. Well, did, absolutely, Did they Joe. say physics? Physics. I, 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 I kind of like that thing. Some you like <laughs> physics? It's almost like my, yeah, my thing is like Alex Physics on Twitter. Yeah, there was a guy named oh, Alex who liked physics. There you go. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you so much to uh, Joe MC for the super chat there. Super duper appreciate it. Uh, oh, different, different person. Joe NC is a different person. Thank you to Joe NC. There, I said it. I said the thing I was supposed to say. Uh, oh, look at that, Tori. It's a Tori Bruno tweet with all the. Uh, with oh the, yeah, the Vulcan flight uh, engine. This is Vulcan oh, flight one, engine two, test firing. I thought we weren't going to do these. <laughs> Done. Oh, it's from a drone. Yeah. Drone. Oh, drone. I'm good at reading. Very cool. Need glasses. I like rocket engines. <laughs> I, I can't wait for Vulcan to come online. I'm super excited for it. And I'm super excited for BE4 to uh, continue to head into, uh, what do you want to call it? Maturity? Um, flight readiness. Flight readiness. Thank you. That's, I would say it's probably already mature. Uh, yeah. But yeah, the, the drone shots of the test firing are super cool. Uh, definitely got to love the openness from Tori there. And uh can't wait for Vulcan. Um, does that mean we're going to do these other things here? Or are we going to call it? Or we just wanted to show this because it's extra cool. Whatever the last ones. Yeah, what is? Okay, cool. All right. Well, uh, I think that's it for this week. We should wrap it up and let everyone get about their, go on about their day. Um, definitely stay tuned to the channel. Subscribe if you haven't already because a lot of cool stuff happening this week and just coming up in general. So thank you to everybody for watching. Ian? Oh, oh no, I blew it. Ian? Yeah, uh, wait, there we go. Thanks for joining <laughs> us this week. See, oh. <laughs> uh, that's Ian, thank you for joining us this week. Oh, there, that's my name right there. Uh, and Alex, thank you for, for just a moment for joining us this week. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, thanks. It's like I'm, it's like I'm raving over here. Okay. <laughs> thanks, Doc. Uh, yep, no problem. And thank you to Das for operating things in the background. With that, we will leave you. <laughs> Ian, I can't even. And with that, we will leave you all nerds until next time. <laughs> See ya. Bye. <laughs> bye bye. Oh.
pressure continues to be normal. Our right, cable pressure looks good. Calling up. Water towers can fly! Yes! Ego down to nominal. Why does that fly up to eat off? Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these.